We can all hear me. Hi, um, announcement. It is just me today. I thought I was going to be talking for 25 minutes. I can stretch this out. We can have a conversation. We can go home. We can do whatever we want. But the other guy, unfortunately, his plane got delayed and he wasn't able to make it here. The weather in Florida, I guess, was less than cooperative. So here we are. So what we're going to talk today uh, is about AI and blockchain, how they might be friends or might not be friends. Uh, I'm Debbie Ginsberg. I used to be at Chicago Kent as the educational technology librarian. Now I'm at Harvard as the faculty services librarian, uh, one of those COVID switches. Um, but I still love talking about the technology and figuring out what it does. So today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, what's going on in blockchain and AI and how they're working together. At one point, I'm going to do a complete switch, which I said in my uh, it's description I was going to do that, because one of the things I like coming home from Cali with is new toys. So I'm going to give you some things that I found really useful, um, some pros and cons now that I have some extra time, and uh, then we'll go back to AI and blockchain. Let's get this started. So thinking about what I'm going to talk about, Cali, and I usually talk about blockchain, but if we're talking about AI, and eventually I'm like, what if we put them together? Two great hypes that hype great together. Yes, I will find a way to insert blockchain into everything I do. It's not that I think it's the greatest thing. It's just an interesting technology that keeps going, even though some people think it shouldn't. Um, I understand, of course, I think at this point, we all know what AI is. Who's been to a webinar by AI? Well, we've all been to webinars by AI. How is it more than one, 10? So I figure at this point, we have a pretty good idea of what that is. Um, but blockchain, of course, is still a little bit new to, uh, or new, but still not a technology that everybody knows off the top of their heads. So blockchain, it's a database that is distributed. So the idea is if the database isn't located in just one place, it's located with many, many copies. For each of those copies, the databases are arranged in a particular way. So there is a block of data. And that is connected to other blocks of data by cryptographic hashtags. And this is what uh, keeps the data very secure. Once the data is put into this block, it can't be changed. So everybody who knows, like, oh, looks at this block, knows that the data has always been what it is in that block. It hasn't been changed. Nothing has um, been tampered with it. And they know because of the crypto ha uh, hashtags, that's what happened. Um, and there's ways that they can trust about how those uh, hashtags were created or how the hashes, not hashtags, hashes were created, how the new blocks were added, because anyone who adds new parts, new blocks to this database has to do some kind of proof. So for Bitcoin, in order to add another block onto the Bitcoin database, you have to do something called proof of work, which is to uh, solve a very, very difficult math problem that can only be solved by brute force. Uh, others like Ethereum use proof of stake. So proof of stake says someone's going to put up some collateral and say, hey, this is what I think. I, yeah, I'm going to stake this collateral that this is good data and I'm in doing this in good faith. And then when the new uh, data gets added, they pick a collateral back plus some additional uh, funds from Ethereum, plus additional Ethereum tokens. So that's the basics of blockchain and what we need to know today. Obviously, there's a lot more complicated um, technologies behind it. We can talk about Merkle trees, but today let's just start here. Um, and I started to think, okay, I've talked about blockchain at a few conferences and it's like, okay, let me catch you all up on what I've, what's going on with blockchain today. And of course, when most people think of blockchain, they think of Bitcoin. And the last time I was really paying a lot of attention to Bitcoin, it was on the way down. We were in this quick graphic winter and the price had gone down. It was still higher than the, I think about $10 of Bitcoin in 2017 at 1,700, then it was like at $15,000 a Bitcoin, um, and it gone down. Uh, and then uh, this year it started to go up, 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 up. And now it seems to hover between $65,000 and $75,000 a Bitcoin. That is a really big change. Why? With anything with Bitcoin, there's usually a number of reasons as to why something has changed. But one of the things that happened here is in August of 2023, the SEC lost a court case where uh, they had said, no, you can't create these EFTs, these exchange trade funds. Uh, I think I got that right. Um, with Bitcoin, that's not gonna be something we're gonna allow, but a court overruled them and the SEC decided to not fight them. 
So as of January this year, the SEC had approved a certain number, I think 12 of these EFTs, that could then use Bitcoin as the basis for um, what could be traded. So this allowed people to invest in Bitcoin, such as that is, without actually having to buy it. So when I got my Bitcoin a few years ago, I had to open up a wallet with um, you know, different kind of exchange. I used Coinbase, Coinbase is evil, um, but you know, uh, but that I would have to do it that way. And that's also one of the points of vulnerability with these uh, cryptos that people buy is they can attack those exchanges. Um, they can't get your wallet, that's pretty solid, but they can attack the exchanges and um, get your funds that way. But now you don't have to go through an exchange. You can work with these investors, these investor groups, these EFTs, and they will do the investment for you. So you can say, I want to direct, invest directly into it. I want to invest in some kind of derivative. I want to invest in a future. So that's one thing that's happened to raise the price. But at this point, it's just sort of sitting. And some people think it will be $100,000 by the end of the year. And some people think it's not going to be. We'll see what happens. But of course, the weird thing about Bitcoin is it's just about Bitcoin. I mean, this is just investing in something that really kind of does nothing. But it does take a lot of energy, and that's something we know about Bitcoin, because uh, the there are fewer Bitcoins for people to find. We did a, something called a halving this year. So when miners uh, do that proof of work, they usually get some Bitcoin. And this year it was halved from 12 something down to six something that they get for each time. Uh, and that means that there's fewer out there. The supply will be, new supply will be less. All the currently, I think the supply is 19 million something. The ultimate supply is 20 million something. That's a uh, number, of course, won't be reached for another 150, 80 years because it's just going to keep dwindling like that. So some people think that the scarcity also led to that. But those math problems, because now they're being solved by lots of people with few returns, they take a lot of energy, a lot of computing energy. I've also talked a lot about NFTs. Yeah, that's what happened to NFTs. Um, and not these non-fungible tokens where you could get like a little bit, you got like a spot on a blockchain that then pointed to something else. That never took off as an investor, uh, really great investment. People are still creating laws about it. So South Korea recently said, uh, you know, th these kinds of NFTs, NFTs that um, actually had value could be regulated. And there's NFTs that don't have like an inherent value and they can't be regulated. So we're still having uh, some questions about how, where they fit within the blockchain crypto regulation space. And there's still scams going on. The New York Times recently had a report on one. It wasn't recent, but that this happened. But apparently someone was going to sell all their NFT art, quote unquote, at Sotheby's. And at the last minute, after all these people showed up at Sotheby's for this auction, they just left and never sold the art. Um, probably because they knew they weren't going to get what they were asking for it, but it's left a lot of people confused and somewhat in the lurch. It's still, so, and yeah, blockchain's still sh uh, chugging along in other things. So Eli, you mentioned blockchain in her, her presentation. You mentioned, oh, blockchain, that's not crypto. There was a lot of promise. Uh, one of my favorite, a couple of my favorite promises were, um, one, using blockchain as a place for identity. So let's say I am going to um, a bar and I want to prove that I'm over 21 because with this gray hair, no one's ever going to know. Uh, and I, but I have to show them all this other information about myself, like where I live, and I don't necessarily want them to know that, but with if my identity was some, on a blockchain, I could just show them what they needed to know. Or you know, when I got my new job a few years ago, I had to literally provide transcripts of where I had been in school. And it was so long ago that finding those transcripts was quite a problem. Um, of course, there's companies that make money off of this, great. But if I had a blockchain that had my identity and said, Immutably, Debbie graduated from this place, and Debbie graduated from this place, and Debbie graduated from this place, um, and that place. Uh, it, I would have had that uh, already established, and I wouldn't have to go and prove it. I could prove it instantly. So there are some thoughts about that. Where it has gone, I've seen a lot of talk about blockchain and uh, helping with supply chains, and this helps establish the provenance of something when it's from where it's created to when it, uh, it goes to point of sale. And some companies have found that to be helpful. Uh, there are still smart contracts out there, even though they're not that popular as we were told they're going to be, but a self-executing uh, contract that depends on data, you know, the blockchain says, this is what's going to happen if the data says this. So I will buy six widgets if the price of 
Oreos is $3 a box. Um, you know, and when it hits that, it's a self-executing contract. Um, some, there's some things like that. And there are some countries that are still experimenting with blockchain. So I've read about some trying, still trying to put things like titles and real estate information into a blockchain. Again, something that you want to establish the provenance of exactly. This is the person who owned this land at this time. It cannot be changed. Everyone can see it. Uh, so we still see some examples, just nowhere near the number it, we were, uh, were told it's going to be some time ago. So what? One, there are other tools on the table. I can make a blockchain database, which is decentralized and has all these parts to it, or I can just use a normal, like a, another kind of database that might do the job I need to do better. Um, they're a bit complicated. So when we start talking about blockchains, we're starting to talk about Marshall trees and hashes and all this really difficult stuff. And it's hard to get buy-in for something that's that complicated. The immutability is both great, but also a problem. So, you know, if you've got countries and uh, regions that say, we want to be able to remove uh, information, we want people to be able to remove information from a database and you have a database that can't happen in, there's some conflict. Um, there's also some scaling issues. So even if you go to Bitcoin, every block in Bitcoin is something like one or two megabytes. And that is something that can't be changed easily uh, because Bitcoin, uh, in order to change it, for all the people who were um, working in the Bitcoin and adding the blocks would have to be like in majority agreement to make that kind of change. And there's just no way to make that happen. The cost, again, is a factor, um, particularly with proof of work where you have to do a lot of computational work in order to get something done. Uh, and we're still not clear. We see, you know, South Korea is still making regulations what the, and other countries. And you know, we've got on the federal and state and local level here in um, the United States, what the laws and regulations are for blockchain and how they apply, um, particularly since the people making the laws and regulations aren't always sure what this technology does. And that should sound a bit familiar because we're seeing something similar with AI. Uh, so I'm sort of seem to be piggybacking on some of the things that Eli mentioned last hour, but we've seen, of course, a lot of hype. Um, and there's, but there's also aspects of costs and security that people really sort of need to address to deal with the hype. So of course the hype we get is, can be really positive. Everyone needs it. It's totally worth this cost uh, because even if it's not the AI is not the, um, the cost of a blockbuster movie, it still has some cost that we need to factor in how that's paid. Um, and we're told it's the future and either it's the future and AI is gonna do stuff for us and make things bad, or it's the future and AI is gonna turn into Skynet and everything is going to be a problem. And it's hard, even if aspects of that hype are actually true, it's hard for us to make decisions among the hype without getting some good hard facts and data. The costs of this, of course, can be really high. So on initial versions of some generative AI, uh, the databases people were working on, uh, they would have much smaller data to train on, and so the costs were low. But what time you get to open AI, I've seen cost figures um, in the close to $100 million, $200 million. And that's something that really pretty much only a company can afford to do. It's really outside of the purview of any academia. Um, to uh, pay that to uh, create that level of training that's necessary for a database like that, which then, of course, gets to issues of access. Who has access to these tools? We talked about access justice. Who is going to be able to benefit from the tools? Um, you know, will it is this sufficient to help someone who doesn't have a lawyer get through? Do they have access to it if they're on the other side of the digital divide? Well, can they use this on um, a flip phone? Is there a way to access it? Like they can access funds? No. Uh, and there's still an energy cost. Again, it may not be that much as a blockbuster, but it's still an energy cost that we're going to want to be thinking about in the long term. There's, of course, also interest, uh, issues of security. We've talked about issues of provenance. Where did the data come from? These AIs tend to be black boxes, so we cannot see where the information is coming from. The data, once it's in there, can be manipulated. So, you know, you can get answers, depending on your prompt, you can get answers that say one thing, you can prompt to have it say another thing. Um, sometimes the AIs will go uh, give you answers that seem to suggest, you know, be on one side of the political spectrum, might be on another side. 
And of course, these AIs can be used to create fakes. And that's one thing that's been really frightening a lot of people. Which means, are we seeing the promise yet? Are we seeing the promise yet for uh, blockchain? Are we seeing it for AI? I don't know. And then what happens if we start to put them together? And they're calling this blockchain 4.0, a merge of blockchain and AI. People start to think about it and they're like, we're gonna have a whole new era of blockchain. Great. What does this mean? They're hoping that the AI, the people have been talking about this, are hoping that AI and blockchain can work together to overcome some of each other's weaknesses. So particularly dealing with areas of trust and security. So for trust, we would, uh, if it was you, the data that the AI was using was in a blockchain that could be seen where the data was transparent that would let people trust what the AI was using in the first place to generate its answers. Um, you could also use the blockchain, again, if it's transparent and has that information in it to see how it was trained. It's immutable. That is how it was trained. There's no doubt about it. It's in the secure blockchain. And if the data changes over time, you can see in the blockchain what changed. In this block, the data is one thing. You know, the price of Oreos is $3 a box. In this, it is $4 a box. So it has changed over time. And together, the blockchain providing the data and the AI providing the analysis, you can better trust the data uh, that the AI is working with because it's no longer in this black box. It also should provide more access for uh, issues with security and uh, in where it has to do with privacy and threat detection and things like that. So, you know, you can have information in a blockchain and the AI would know this information is private and no one can access it. Or the AI would know this information is sensitive and only certain people can access it. Um, and the, uh, the fact that, you know, blockchain is fairly secure, but there are ways that people can attack it. And the AI being able to recognize patterns would be able to recognize threats against the blockchain, helping it stay more secure. So not only, not only provides the analysis, it provides some measure of extra protection to that blockchain. So what does this mean? I've seen a few proposed ideas. In healthcare, ways to protect medical information. So you know the medical information could be on the blockchain. The AI would be able to uh, search that medical information in a way that protects uh, privacy and who has access who has, uh, to what data. Um, and it would be something that, you know, there would be no question of what the data is, it's there. And if someone had a question about, wait, how does this data relate? They would be able to go to the blockchain to see it. We've seen it again in supply chains. The supply chain may provide data but the, uh, about how a transaction is done, but the AI could provide a layer of analysis on top of that, um, letting uh, people who use the AI for supply chains to make uh, better decisions or in smart contracts. The way they do now, they're fairly inflexible, but by using AI to um, add another measure of work onto these smart contracts, they can become more flexible. So blockchain tends to be fairly rigid. Maybe AI is too, uh, really doesn't have uh, enough of a form, but between the two of them, they can work together to bound what each other's weaknesses are in terms of one being too rigid and the other being the complete opposite. So a typical report, uh, proposal, retail. A predictive action um, is done by the AI. It predicts what needs to happen. And then when uh, a processing uh, needs to happen, the blockchain does the processing. Healthcare monitors medical data while the blockchain provides secure and accurate medical history. Cybersecurity, the, um, what, if you're looking at a network, the AI provides data analysis and the blockchain provides a record if something happens. Manufacturing, uh, AI monitors, and blockchain handles the purchasing. So in general, what we're seeing from these ideas is the AI does sort of the analytical work, the predictive work, the, the work that's a little more nebulous. While the blockchain does sort of like the day-to-day -day work, it will provide the record, it handles the transaction, it handles the thing that's definitely, what well, this happens, this happens, this happens, that's what the blockchain does. And this is what people are hoping will happen if AI and blockchain can work together. Now, of course, there are some many issues here. Blockchain already doesn't scale. Uh, it doesn't scale very well. So will these ideas scale? And people aren't sure. Can the two kinds of technologies talk to each other? 
can a blockchain database work with an AI database in an effective way? And people are still trying to figure out ways to make that happen. And of course, we're still trying to deal with the law of blockchain after all of these years. And we're starting to deal with the law of AI. Are people really, and there's a lot of confusion over these two as separate entities. How is this going to work together in the legal space? And we're not sure about that yet either. So what am I seeing? In doing my initial research for this, I kept seeing the word could. I kept seeing the word can. But what I didn't see was the word will or has done. This is very theoretical. So I'm seeing lots of theory. And the theory goes back to you know, the you know, 2017 or even before, obviously ramping up in 2021, 2023, 2024, um, as people start to think about generative AI. But, but there's a lot of ideas of what could happen, but not a lot of ideas for implementation. And just like sometimes blockchain seems like a solution looking for a problem, and sometimes AI looks like a solution working for a problem, neither of these may be the right tool for the, this job, um, either separately or together. So I was thinking to myself, I have got to be missing something. What am I missing? Where are the actual implementations? What are people actually doing? There's got to be something by now. So I started thinking, OK, I'm going to try to research using some of the fun AI tools that are now available to us. And that's why the original title for this was Using an AI to Catch an AI, because I was thinking, maybe this could help. So this is where I'm about to take a complete 90 degree turn, because like I, I really like getting out of Cali fun toys. So let's look at some fun toys. So. Would I use commercial AIs like ChatGPT? Particularly at the time I started doing this, they're just too broad. The hallucinations, Claude, your hallucinations are terrible. Um, their focus could vary, so they might not necessarily be giving me the types of answers that I wanted because their uh, focus was more general than academic fo focused. So I started to use some of the AI research tools that are out there to help me with this problem. Couple shout outs before I get started. Zotero. Anyone here use Zotero? I love Zotero. This is not an AI tool. This is a tool for organizing all of my work. I have been used this for many years. Uh, it lets me create a whole bibliography of what I've been researching, and I can get things into the bibliography through my browser. So if I'm on browser and I'm leading a blog post or I'm leading an article that I think is really relevant to my research, or even something I want to look at later, I just click the browser extension and it shows up in Zotero and I can deal with it uh, as part of my bibliography or as something I want to read later. And it even comes with nice metadata uh, for me to look at and use for my citations later. And it can even export citations, not perfectly, uh, in various methods. Theoretically, Blue Book as well. Last time I tried it, it didn't work nearly as well as I hoped, but there's possibilities. So Zotero, not AI, at least not yet, but still a big workhorse that's been around a long time if you need to organize academic research. Then I want to shout out to CAG, or Kagi. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, so who's planning to go to AALL, the uh, Wall Library Conference later this year? Few takers here. So the person who's going to be uh, doing our keynote is Corey Doctorow. Everyone, does anyone know who that is? Who's Corey Doctorow? What? Uh, author's son. What about the author himself? Well, the author himself, I like too, but that's his son. Okay, well, what, what's his role in the tech world, Eli? So, so what Eli has been telling us is he's the founder of a blog. Uh, do you mean Boing Boing? Boing Boing the blog, um, which I read for many years. And um, there's all kinds of tech articles. He's written dozens of tech articles. He's written books and fiction and nonfiction about tech and the effect of tech. And recent, uh, uh, um, uh, one of the recent articles I re read from him recommended this search engine called Kagi. I'm like, well, let me check it out. I'm like, whoa, this search engine, I was not getting great results from Google, not as nearly robust as I wanted, even in the Google Scholar. And here I got, you know, it can give you a nice AI answer if I want it, plus a lot of great information uh, organized together uh, about different kinds of um, articles about blockchain and AI. 
and I really found it a powerful tool to help me with my search. There is a problem with uh, Kagi though, and that is it is not free. I can search, do a hundred searches with Kagi and then I have to pay. Who here is already paying for some kind of access to an AI or a database and do we want to pay for more? Not really. Moving on. So those are a couple of fun things to start with. Um, so then I started, but you know, my main thing I was using for search before I was using for Cog, looking at Kagi is perplexity. Has anyone seen perplexity? So a few perplexity users here. And I like it because it combines a robust search with an AI uh, synopsis and then tells me what the different sources are. And I've often found those sources to be really relevant. And I can do different kinds of searches over time. So I can go back and say, oh, this is the search I did. And I can add on to it or I can review what it said. So it's, you know, I find it much better for giving me reliable information with an AI answer than I was able to get from something like ChatGPT. JSTOR. Anyone here use JSTOR? Got a few JSTOR users in the library in academic land. JSTOR is a database that we use to, that has a really good um, collection of journal articles and books and art and all kinds of things. Tends to focus on older stuff than newer stuff, but did anyone know that JSTOR recently released an AI beta? And they have. Somehow I managed to find it and sign up for it. I wish I remember how. Um, and so I can ask it, you know, I can do a keyword search and then if it's not giving me quite what I want, I can say, give me instead of the keyword search, there's a little box that says keyword. I can click the experimental beta and get a beta search of, of what I'm looking for instead. Sometimes I find it's better, sometimes it's about the same, um, but it's an interesting tool that we're starting to see in our databases because up till now, for those of us who have to deal with other kinds of databases beyond Lexis and Westlaw, which is a lot of us, we hadn't been seeing quite the same thing. There's a question, what's it? Do you see what it is? Yeah. No, I just need to know if there was a problem. Okay, so that is, uh, we're, the first that I've started seeing in some of the general databases we have access to. Research Rabbit, anyone seen this before? It's a fun one. So one of the things I could take Research Rabbit and I can put in a paper or a set of papers and then Research Rabbit looks, it's within a sort of small set of, relatively small set of academic journals, academic articles, open access. And it says, I think these things are related. And here's a fun graph as to how I think these things are related. And then I can say, okay, from these things that you think are related, focus on this and then uh, let me know what else is related to that. And I can keep going down this rabbit hole as far as I want to. Uh, so I can take one thing and see what's related and just keep going until I get the answers that I want or I think I found everything I, I think is, I'm gonna be able to find in this database. Uh, you can info, uh, input your library from Zotero it won't take everything, just the things that it has access to. So I can take, all right, from all these things I have in Zotero, find me related articles, and it, or just take these few items from my Zotero and find me related articles and go from there. And I think that's one of the things we're gonna be doing a little bit more with research. And one of the ways that research and AI can work together is finding that relatedness that's otherwise kind of difficult for us to do with just a keyword search. Um, so this can maybe be able to bring us uh, kinds of articles and access to materials we wouldn't have thought of looking at before. That element of serendipity that people are used to saying, like back when I was able to walk through my uh, my library, I could just pull a book and you know get uh, this you know these serendipity would lead me to the perfect thing. And that's sort of that issue, that way of doing research has been lost uh, for I mean, we were just searching online and things like this are trying to bring it back. Research Rabbit is free. Connected Papers is a little bit similar. And I can put in a paper and it shows me papers that are related, how they're related. Um, not the same way of going down a rabbit hole, but again, a, another way for me to see what might be related that I'm not thinking about when I'm looking at the, you know, this paper or looking at this topic. So, but a Research Rabbit, again, gives you five graphs per month for free. And after that, you have to pay. So not always free. So some of these tools I found to be incredibly powerful um, for research. And then there are other tools I've been using 
other than some tools I found to be you know, great starts. Then there are the tools I use for organization other than Zotero. Do anyone from here familiar with Notion? Notion is a, a online tool, you can also get it in the desktop, that lets you sort of just create open projects. You can create pages, you can put tasks lists, and you can link all this information together. And a lot of people like to use Notion to organize projects. For me, it didn't really take off uh, something useful until I found two tools I could use within Notion to help me with my research. And here you'll see me researching another topic, not this one, but a different topic, but it still was really helpful. So one, I can use something called Notero. Uh, it's a little esoteric to install, but once I got it installed, it was able to take, again, that extensive bibliography that I've been building up in Zotero by clicking my little button and saying, put it in Zotero. Uh, and I was able to put a little bit more information in a more visual way than I can do in Zotero, and I like that. Plus, and again, you have to pay like $8 a month for this. I could get an AI tool that could go through what I had and I could ask the AI tool questions about what was in my library. And that was similar to something, David, you think you released last year, um, but now within Notion, so I can do it, or I'm storing other information with Notion so I can do this whole semantic search within my Zotero library while maintaining other information about what's in my bibliography and what I want to use and what I don't want to use. So Notion plus Notero, plus the AI tool can be a really powerful way to do research. Then there's one of my favorites, Notebook LML. Anyone tried that? This is an experiment from a couple of people. This is an experiment from Google. Bizarrely, you can't search with it, but it does keep a lot, let you keep uh, your information that you're researching and ask it questions. So I, it can't talk directly to, um, the web. You can't import Zotero. As of a couple, maybe last week, this week, you can finally say, here's the website of something I want to add, and it can add it before you could only upload PDFs. So I uploaded a bunch of PDFs or websites, and then I started to just say, here is all my information that I've done. Can I ask you questions about it? Can you do some synopses? Because that is generally one of the things that Generate AI does well, is if you give it information, again, this is sort of within retrieval augmented generation. It's not perfect, but it generally provides a really good start. And among other things it can do is it can provide me a table of contents. It can provide me a brief. It can provide me a timeline, uh, or I can ask it particular questions. Like, can you tell me how AI improves smart contracts? And I'll say, well, within this information you've given me, this is what it can do. So, and here are the sources from which I took this information because you're probably going to want to review it. So this has been one of my favorite tools to do this kind of research so I can start to ask questions where I, you know, again, I have a fairly decent idea what the uh, is because I've read all these articles, but I'm like, wait, I'm misremembering something. Can you tell me a little bit more? Or I don't remember what source had this information. Can you point me to it? Or I can just ask random questions and see what I get. Again, that element of serendipity that I don't think you can produce any other way. Uh, through this. Um, and this has, again, been really helpful uh, resource for me to organize information for something like this presentation. So those are my fun tools. Back to AI. So looking for a real life example. Um, the best one I was able to find is IBM and Hyper International were working on a project together. And it combined an AI product that IBM had and then a blockchain. So the blockchain kept track of where these coffee and cocoa beans were produced from the point of when they left the farm to the point that they were sold. So once they did that, they were able to say, you know, they could say for sure this is what happened to it. On top of the blockchain, they put AI for some analysis and also to help the farmers make decisions. So it'd be like, here's some climate information you need to know before you go uh, you know, produce your, uh, your crop and then add everything to blockchain. And these are things that are working together. And they were saying, this is a great way we brought this together. What it didn't have, what the IBM still talking about them is this themselves, they're really proud of this, but they didn't explain what the outcome was. They're like, this would be great for the farmers. Was it great for the farmers? How much did it improve? Did it improve yields? Did it improve prices? What happened? And IBM did not tell me what happened. So we're still missing a lot of information, even for experiments that have been tried, 
and what the outcome is. So what does this mean for law? Because this is a law school conference. So there are things that our students, our faculty, everyone else in the law school space need to know about blockchain and AI working in particular. And it's not quite the same thing of what they need to know about AI by itself, because that's really going to have an effect. At this point, I really can't say, oh my God, you have to teach a class in this. But there will be things that our law students are going to want to know, areas that they might specialize in. So one of the ideas is making smarter contracts. So the, that might require some uh, lawyers to know about how these work. And so be able to, you know, if they have, are some classes that can address how this technology is being used as part of contracts or as part of an upper level class could be useful. The other thing, of course, that has to happen is the regulations, the statutes, the court cases, the local laws all still have to be written. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there, and that's going to require the legal expertise of our students and our faculty. So again, the more they know about this kind of technology or how to learn about this kind of technology should it come up, uh, this is the kind of thing they will need to know. And of course, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits because once you start to implement this, things are going to go wrong. So again, the lawyers who know about this will have an edge over those who do not. Which brings us to the end. Is this really something that's going to happen? And I can see it going two ways. The promises and limitations can make it go one way or another. One, uh, the articles that write about it say, blockchain and AI can work together to shore up each other's limitations and reduce something that's more effective than either of them separately. Or these, we're never going to be able to really cross those limitations that exist uh, between AI and blockchain, uh, either for scalability and talking to each other, or even laws can prevent it. And so it's not realistic for us to think for uh, to go ahead. And if I was thinking about this, and I'm seeing what's going to happen, I'm fairly sure there is going to be a merger. People are going to try more experiments like IBM. There are a lot of people who have written theory. They're going to want to put it into practice. Um, and there's some particular use cases I know people are really interested in. So you know, when it comes to fakes in particular, let's say you've got um, a video that a news network has made of a particular politician, and you know, it can be manipulated all kinds of ways, not just using AI, but traditional tools. But if that video was stored on a blockchain or something immutable and secure like it with AI being able to, for people to search and come back to, yes, this is the real copy. Um, that may be one strong reason for those things to work together to provide uh, a way of like what the actual truth is. Um, so did they really say that? The blockchain will tell us whether the video we're seeing is a manipulated fake or if we can point to the original, if it's just a copy of the original. And if all else fails, there's always crypto. Eli in her talk mentions the promise of blockchain didn't really go well, and I'm excluding crypto. Because where, of course, we've seen blockchain go is through cryptocurrencies. But cryptocurrencies, they're just built on top of a blockchain, but they're not really a thing. In the world of AI and crypto, in many cases, they are trying to make it a little less tenuous. So this is an example of, which one is this? Fetch AI. And Fetch AI says we can build all these great AI products with our stuff. And uh, one of the things that Fetch AI has done is it's using a blockchain to track resources that AI uses so it can balance out what programs are using which resources when. So it's, you know, this, uh, resource isn't being used and this AI program needs it, they can work together and then uh, balance out other resources as needed so they don't have um, inefficiencies. But of course, the other thing they had to do was they had to uh, create financing. So there is a Fetch AI crypto coin that also is uses AI and blockchain, mostly blockchain to create the cryptocurrency itself. And I've seen a few examples of things like this. There's one called the graph, um, a couple others, Oceanfront. Uh, and they are meant to bring these two together. And this is where I'm seeing the most action. But just as we were saying uh, in the last presentation, you know, there's blockchain with crypto and blockchain without crypto where you, know, you think the actual development would be. 
seems like it's all happening, right? A lot of it's happening within crypto, but that tends to just affect things in that space. If they really can develop effective AI uh, tools using blockchain as ways to balance resources, that'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, but I'd like to see if it could be done without the coin as well. So will AI and block, are they and blockchain friends? Not quite yet. Will I expect to see some more developments next year? I still think it's gonna be theoretical. I don't think we're gonna see a really quick change, but it is something I think it's worth keeping an eye on, particularly if we ever can see some of the AI, can uh, realize some of the great promises that blockchain had, particularly in establishing identity and establishing the truth of things. So we'll see what happens next year, but this year, that's where we are now. And do you have any questions about either blockchain or my favorite toys? All right, I was able read, to do 40 minutes. Read the question from the online attendee. Um, it is, with respect to smart contracts, would the AI have discretion to determine if conditions are met? If so, is it similar to adjudicating or legal advising? The answer to the first question is yes. The answer to the second question uh, would be, it depends. It's my favorite answer. Um, you can tell I was once a lawyer uh, because, you know, who has made the decisions of whether that is the uh, equivalent of adjudicating or advising or not, and whether it's legal adjudication or legal advice, because it could be, you know, just advice that you get that doesn't fall within that sphere, or it could fall within that sphere. And now we have some additional questions to ask. And have I seen anyone really think about that yet? No. Who wants a paper? No one wants to write this paper? Good question, I like it. More questions? Everyone want cookies? Eli. So during my presentation, I kind of lied. <laughs> you keep saying because, that. Because, um, you know, I mentioned blockchain non-crypto, but I left out web 3.0. So I'm wondering, did you in your research find any applications that are con that are combining like this new decentralized platforms for information and other services with generative AI that's based on the blockchain? That mostly came up in the ideas of whether this blockchain and AI could work together to establish identity um, on a larger scale. Um, so I saw it come up with that or um, in information where, you know, the blockchain would establish the data, the AI would be available for on a decentralization for a larger purpose. So for larger access, if that's what you're one of the things we we're thinking about. Um, most of what I saw tended to be fairly industry specific. So this will help healthcare. This will help smart contracts. Uh, this will protect this network. So they tended to be fairly discreet rather than some of the larger ideas that we saw from uh, 3.0. Like I said, some ideas about identity uh, notwithstanding. That's it. I think they're done. <laughs>